My wife spotted I was a bit breathless one day. I went to see my own GP. Fortunately, I had a, an ECG machine in the surgery. He gave me an ECG check. Wasn't very happy with it. Um, told me to leave my car outside the surgery and uh, I had to phone my sister-in-law to take me to the hospital. He, he tested me with this, with, this, with this listening device and this thing said, I think that you're having a heart attack. So he rang Stepping Hill and I ended up in um, emergency admissions for five days. And they said, no, I don't think you've had a heart attack, but I think you've got angina. When my doctor, Mr. Waters was uh, interviewing me or giving me my diagnosis, etc., he did go into uh, the type of valve I could have, which was a mechanical one or a tissue one. If I had the bypass, I would be as fit, if not fitter, than I was prior to, prior to the heart attack. You don't want to sit around at the age of 52 and become a, an 85-year-old man sat in an armchair. I'd rather be uh, fit and participate with my children and possibly with grandchildren. Most of us have come to realise that heart-related diseases are the biggest killers in the Western world. Here in Britain, over a quarter of a million people die from heart disorders every year. So, who exactly is at risk? Which of these people would you guess has a heart condition? Is it him? Could it be her? What about them? Well, in fact, it's all of them. Outward appearance counts for nothing. These people have had something wrong with their heart. You've been given this video because you, like thousands of others, have a problem with your heart. You'll know by now that this needs to be put right. But at this stage, a whole range of thoughts will be going through your mind. This video has been given to you to answer some of your questions about what happens next, to put your mind at rest about what is to happen to your heart. It may have come as a surprise to you at first that you need surgery on your heart. We all suspect that our heart, like our brain, is likely to be a risky thing to tamper with. True, but don't worry. There's no need to be alarmed. Today, open heart surgery techniques are very advanced, with survival rates well above 95%. And that's where this video comes in. It'll explain just how heart surgery works, what will happen to you as you progress back to full health, and how you can maintain a healthy heart for the future. Let's start by establishing why you need to have heart surgery at all. Heart problems fall into two categories. The first is coronary artery disease, which affects the vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle. The second category is disease of the heart valves. Both of these can go on to affect the way the heart muscle pumps blood around the body. Heart attacks are the result of a condition called atherosclerosis. Over a period of time, fatty deposits, or cholesterol, collect on the inside walls of the arteries. These fatty deposits build up and narrow or even block the artery altogether. One of the strange things about the heart is that it needs blood to function itself, as well as supplying blood to the rest of the body. If one or more of these arteries become narrowed, the heart will continue to function, but with a reduced blood supply, causing pain. This patient is suffering from angina. As well as recurring, it's painful and disabling. Angina warns the patient that they may be at risk of a heart attack. A heart attack happens when the blood supply to the heart becomes so restricted that part of it dies from oxygen deprivation, what's known as a myocardial infarction. Coronary heart disease often has quite strong family connections. Family members may often have a genetic tendency towards hyperlipidemia, a condition where the blood has a high level of cholesterol. But heart problems that need surgery are often due to no fault of our own. These may be congenital abnormalities, such as abnormal valves. 
Later in life, some can develop narrowing of the arteries and damage or disease of the heart valves. By this stage, the outpatient's waiting room will be familiar to you, and you'll already have had some, if not all, of the tests these patients are going through. You may have recognized this test from TV programs. It's an electrocardiogram, or ECG. It's how we monitor the activity of your heart and record what your heart is doing. It may be that blood flow to your heart is adequate when you're at rest, but the exercise ECG is designed to show up insufficient blood flow when you exercise. The images on the echocardiogram screen, generated using ultrasound waves, give information about the pumping ability of the heart and how well the heart valves are working. You're also likely to have had an angiogram. It's basically an x-ray of the blood vessels in and around your heart. There's little risk in the procedure and you probably found it only slightly uncomfortable. Okay, we're just taking it from a different angle now. You may even have watched what happened on the TV screen. A dye is injected through a thin tube into an artery at your groin or elbow to show up any narrowing of the walls of the arteries around your heart. I went to Willenshaw for this angiogram test and um, it's, a, it's a case of pushing a tube, it makes a little incision in your groin and they put the tube through and they put dye inside so they can see and it shows your arteries up and you can watch what's going on through your own television set. At this point you'll have been told what was found and, more importantly, what happens next. Most patients find it a great relief to know the results of this test, even when it's likely to mean an operation. One of your artery, which is a branch of the main artery, is blocked in the middle, and you can see there's very little flow going through it, very little blood going through it. But if at this stage there's more you want to know, it's important that you ask. When they've done the test and they put me in the recovery room, Dr. Hancock, the lady who'd done the test, came up and said to me, well, uh, Mr. Fellows, I'm afraid that you've got uh, problems with a, a blockage in your arteries. You're going to have to have a heart operation. And I could have fell off. The I was laid down on the trolley, but I could have fell off. I didn't expect her to say that. I was so shocked, I said to her, are you going to do it now? She said, no, 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 no. You're going to have to see the surgeons and this, that and the other. And it ended up that I had two blockages. Following these tests, you'll have seen the surgeon to discuss what's proposed, either in the ward or at an outpatient's clinic. Okay. Uh, you know, your angiogram showed that you had blockages in three of the blood vessels yeah, in the heart. Yeah. The good news is that your heart muscle is in good shape. Oh, okay. Uh, but obviously, the, because the medication you're on aren't working at the moment, and the best way to deal with your symptoms is to do some coronary artery grafts or bypass grafts yes. to relieve, to improve the blood supply to the heart. Mm, yeah. Your surgeon will have talked to you in some detail about your own particular circumstances. This is important because all heart operations are major surgery and do have some risks attached. The fact that you're diabetic and hypertensive adds an extra bit of risk to the operation. Yeah. And the risk is in the region of about 2%, I would think. Yeah. Yeah, but. Uh, that means out of 100 patients, two don't make it through the operation, but 98% mm, make yeah, it through the operation. Yeah. Over 95% of patients who have the operation have an excellent result. Yeah. This is the point at which you'll have been put on the waiting list for your operation. When the time comes, finding out about your stay is much easier these days. To make the arrangements for your stay as worry-free as possible, you'll be given the name and number of someone to call. I'm coming to hospital at the end of the week. I'm just a bit concerned about which part I report to. Who's waiting list are you on, please? I'm the waiting list coordinator for heart surgery at Withenshaw, and my job is twofold. I'm a nurse, first and foremost, and secondly, I'm responsible for the administrative management of the waiting list. Um, I work in collaboration with the surgeons, and I plan the operating lists, basically. So I would be responsible for ensuring that patients received their operations uh, within the waiting list targets that are set for us. You so what time I have to be there? The patients are given a contact number when they go to outpatients by most of the consultants, and that contact number is ours. Patients can ring for any query they may have, for any query about the waiting time, and also for any queries around the clinical condition. 
Can you give me some idea how long I'll be kept in hospital? So a patient would probably ask us things like, where do I need to go on the day of my admission to hospital? What do I need to bring with me? And although most of these patients have been to the preoperative clinic, we do appreciate that it is an anxious time for them and sometimes they need to have another reminder of what sort of drugs they need to stop taking. Thank you. Bye now. This okay. specialist nurse is there to help you, whatever your question. Whatever the reason, everybody has concerns before going into hospital. You'll have some too. When I had the angiogram, the result of that was that uh, the doctor told me later that I'd got two blocked arteries uh, and that I'd need a bypass operation. I'm a fatalist. All right? I have no religion, I'm a fatalist. And I always say, what will be, will be. If it's got to be done, it's got to be done. And I was quite calm, I was quite calm, although my heart did race when she first told me and I did break out into a sweat. Well, I'm not particularly concerned about my uh, the treatment I'm going to have. Uh, it's coming home, I think, is uh, the problem, I would think, you know, as far as m myself is concerned, because I'm rather an impatient person and like to do things, so it's going to be difficult, I know. Being human, your mind always thinks of the negative. And I was thinking of the negative for quite a long time. But then you go away to against the positive and the negative disappears. You know, see what the positives are. Forget the negative, you know. It's, uh, it's either life or existence, and I'd rather have life. Just need to clean the skin for you. Shortly before admission for your operation, you'll be asked to come to a pre-op clinic to see your specialist nurse and doctor to check your fitness for surgery. There's another sample that just checks your clotting is normal. Some of the tests you've already had may be repeated. And the final sample, that just checks, make sure you're not anemic and your white cell count's normal, make sure there's no infection going on there. Right, just pop these leads on here and we'll get the ECG that will give us a picture of the electrical activity in your heart. And I just need you to relax and just keep nice and still and it'll just take a few seconds. So, in your case too, tests have shown up heart problems and a need for open heart surgery to put the problem right. But these are usually routine procedures involving no more than a short stay in hospital. So much for getting your mind round the operation. What about the practicalities of arriving at the hospital? Here at Withenshaw, patient and visitor parking is simple and easy. There are three car parks at the east, west and south entrances. All are close to the hospital with easy access to the wards and clinics. And five parking areas close to the entrances are set aside for disabled patients. As you leave the hospital car park, you pay a pound for each visit up to 24 hours. If you have to make lots of visits, ask on the ward or at outpatients about a scheme that can reduce your parking costs. But you or your relatives don't have to have a car to get to the hospital. Public transport is a really practical alternative. Within the Manchester area, there are direct bus services to Withenshaw Hospital from Altrincham, Cheadle Hume, Chalton, Sale, Manchester Airport, the city centre and all points in between. All services stop close to the east, west and south entrances. By rail, the most convenient stations are Manchester Piccadilly and Manchester Airport, with bus links direct to the hospital. And if for any reason you can't make it to hospital under your own steam, an ambulance can be arranged for you through your own GP. Withenshaw is a nationally recognised heart centre, but on the personal level, keen to make you feel welcome. Let's have a look at what happens when we arrive at Withenshaw. Good morning. Can I have your name, please? Munton, M-U-N-T-O-N. Date of birth, David? 2nd of the 4th, 38. Today, David, you're coming into F6 under Miss Bridgewater, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. OK, love it. Straight along the main corridor there where it says all of the wards and departments. At the very end, there's a lift on the right. You go in the lift, press number 2, to the second floor, just turn right along the corridor, you'll see F6. Bye. Bye. This is the day room where we'd like you to sit just for a while.
Like all of us, you will want to have a healthy heart. But getting your mind round it may be something else. Both you and your family may well have questions you will want to ask the staff. Any questions? How long will the operation take? Don't be afraid to ask questions, no matter how trivial they may seem. The staff will encourage both you and your family to talk about anything that's on your mind. After all, it's your operation and your heart. Good morning. Can I just have you? Yes. My yes, name is sir. Alan. I'm from the Ticket Club. Um, we're a patient support group for Withenshire Hospital. And you may want to talk to someone who's already been through open heart surgery. Members of the Ticker Club, an association of ex-patients, visit the wards every day, but will be happy to talk to you and your family even before your hospital experience, either in the hospital or in your own home. Do you have any things that you'd like to say to me about that before? I know any questions well, that I can help you with. Obviously, there's fear, isn't it? I'm frightened, and <laughs> yes. we need people to talk to. Here's a little uh, leaflet about our, uh, our ticker club. Uh, it explains what we do before the operation for you, um, the support we can give you while you're in yes, hospital yeah. and afterwards. And if you've got any questions afterwards, please feel free. We're not medical people. We're just folk that have had the operation done. Right, Mr Matthews, this is your room here. But now it's time for your operation. You'll usually come into hospital the night before your operation. Put all your pyjamas and bits and bobs in. Yes, that's OK. Fine. Thank you. I will be coming along to shave your chest shortly. OK. Thanks very much. That night, you'll see members of the surgical team, the nursing staff looking after you, and the anaesthetist. This will also be another opportunity for you to ask questions. I need to know, how bad's your angina? I mean, how much can you do before you start getting symptoms? Not very much at all. Uh, on an incline, possibly 25 to 50 yards. The next day, you'll be given a pre-med, usually in the form of a tablet, to make you drowsy. Then, in the anaesthetic room, you'll be given a general anaesthetic. During the operation, your heart's function will be taken over by the heart-lung machine. Since it was introduced, surgeons have been able to replace damaged valves, to clear out or bypass blocked or narrowed coronary arteries, and, in severe cases, to replace the entire organ. A coronary artery bypass operation involves the removal of a non-essential artery or vein, usually from inside the chest wall and the arm or leg. One end is then joined to the heart at the aorta and the other to the coronary artery, bypassing the blocked branch. This restores normal blood flow to the heart and so relieves the pain. Right, sir, there are two different types of valve. Uh, you may be told it's your heart valves that need attention. The four valves of the heart ensure that blood is only pumped in one direction towards the lungs and body. If a valve becomes narrowed or leaks, the heart has to work harder. A damaged valve can either be repaired or replaced. The two very different types of valve. The commonest are mechanical, which are longer lasting but will involve your taking anticoagulant drugs after the operation to thin the blood, or tissue valves, usually taken from an animal. If you do need a replacement valve, your surgeon will discuss with you the most suitable type of valve beforehand. Don't worry, you won't get a, a bad valve. They're all tested before they go in you. Yeah. David, you're doing really well. Let's take this tube out for you now and you can do some breathing on your own. Let's cut the tape. Pull the air out, open your mouth. Is why did you come? <coughs> oh, well done. After the operation, medication by drip, injection or in tablet form will keep you comfortable while your body adjusts to the effects of the operation. Pain relief is very important to your recovery. And you're breathing on your own. Well done, you've done really well. The operation's all over and you're on intensive care. Well done. Recovery after surgery is an important part of rehabilitation, but the rate of recovery can be different for each patient. I actually have been operated on, I'd been through intensive care. The first recollection of awareness was back in the high dependency unit. I had the drains removed from my chest and um, 
a bed bath in HDU. Um, but I can vague, vaguely remember that happening, but I know it happened then, but, I mean, that's all I can remember about it. I went to sit up. I thought, oh, weapon hey, that's great. Because before, I used to have trouble sitting up. You have to, have to lean back, eggs, legs in the air, and, 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 and roll out of bed. Didn't have to do that. I just, just, just use this elbow, and I'm still doing that now. I could sit up in bed easier. And it was only, what, two days after the operation? On the ward itself, I don't know whether they do it on purpose or not, but the food situation is you've got to go and help yourself. And I think that's done on purpose, to make you get out of bed and go and get some food. <laughs> Just, Just checking check your blood pressure. Just sleep a little bit. bit. Though recovery rates vary, it's inevitable that everyone feels some mild physical after-effects of surgery. In the first few days, you'll soon feel tired after exercise. You may feel some discomfort in your upper body as the bones begin to knit together again. You may lose your sense of taste or smell for a while. Don't worry. These are normal reactions and should clear up during the first few weeks after your operation. When you start walking around, it starts to feel much better again. OK, now we go to do your arm exercise. Exercise is important after the operation so that vital muscles, particularly in your chest and legs, get to work again. That's fine. All right, Glenys, yeah, if you fine. feel a little bit more short of breath... It won't be long before the physiotherapist has you out of bed to walk up and down the ward. Even at this stage, on the second or third day after the operation, you may realise how much better you feel than before the operation. Very good, you're doing really well. Uh, your breathing's better, um, and even though you can't really do too much at the moment, the exercises I can do, I can do a lot more easier than I could before. And I felt better every day, and I'm still feeling better.